Okay, welcome everyone, and uh, just to, to echo Hillary's uh, gratitude for all of you being here on a cold and rainy election day night to talk about God. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces and some new faces as well. Uh, what I want to do tonight is to pick up where we left off last week, and uh, my handout that if you pick, pick up the new handout uh, today, you'll see that it overlaps a little bit with the very end of last week's handout, so this is sort of uh, something that's forming as we go along. And I realize too that like last week, my outline tonight is probably a little bit ambitious for the amount of time that we have. So I, I'm aware of that going in. And what I'd like to do with you is just take our time and work through the issues um, as the material itself dictates. And then uh, if we have more to talk about next time, then we'll, we'll just address that then. But I would rather work through the issues with you um, so that we can follow, uh, follow the subject matter uh, rather than just trying to push through. So um, before I begin, what I'd like to do with you tonight is first recap a little bit of what we did last week, just as a refresher. And then, whereas last week we talked about faith and reason, mainly issues having to do with faith and reason, tonight I want to talk about faith and revelation and then building upon that uh, rational arguments for the existence of God. That's the territory I want to press into tonight. Before I do that, I want to address two points from last week. Uh, one, to clarify something I said, and second, to correct something that I said in error. Um, so there were a couple of questions after the last uh, presentation. Uh, one point, last week I mentioned that we don't experience God. Instead, we experience his created effects. And I want to clarify what I mean by that in case you took away a different different idea from what I intended. While it's true that we don't experience God per se, right, by sensory experience, you can't see, taste, touch, smell God, right, uh, who's transcendent and who's immaterial, I don't mean to suggest that we can't know God through experience. Um, and tonight, as we go on to rational demonstrations for God's existence, I hope it becomes a little bit clearer how uh, we can know God by reflecting on our experience, right? Because all of our knowledge in some way or other comes through our senses, right? Which, isn't, which is not empiricism. We talked a little bit about Hume, David Hume last week in passing. I'm not advocating that view. But it is still true that everything we know in some way or other comes to us through our experience of the world. Um, so I do want to allow for that uh, in what I said. And also, um, there's a broad and narrow sense, I think, of experience. So I was using the term in a narrow sense to refer to sensory experience, but I suppose in a broader sense, uh, you can understand experience to just be the undergoing of some right event, something like that. And so in addition to our sensory experience, you might think of a spiritual experience, right? We have an intellect. Um, some of the saints maybe have had uh, their, their, their minds enlightened by God, right? Through kind of an infused knowledge, the illumination of the intellect. Some have had uh, locutions and things like that, and that's different from sensory experience, but in a broad sense, you might say that they're experiencing God, and I, and I want to allow for that too. Um, there was secondly a point that I made in passing without thinking about it much. We were talking about the difference between living faith and faith as just a kind of notional, intellectual point uh, in saying that was to stress the difference between simply knowing that there's a God, maybe by some kind of faith, and having a living, saving relationship with God, what we mean by saving faith or living faith. And in passing, in trying to make that point, I, I mentioned the devil having faith. I want to correct that point. Um, the devil being an angel, even though he doesn't have the beatific vision, which is what I was thinking, maybe he has, has a kind of faith, um, because of the, the spirituality of the angels, at least as a, as a generally held theological opinion, not something the church is officially taught on, um, we don't generally say, we don't say that angels have faith, per se, including the fallen angels. So I just want to correct that. That wasn't a central point that I made last week, but I didn't want to leave you with a, with a misapprehension. Okay, so before we pick up, just to recap uh, some of the ground we covered last time. Some of you will remember this, uh, but just to kind of bring it back after a week. Um, last week we looked at the relationship of faith and reason, and we looked at the nature of faith. And, and a couple of points that we took away, a few points that we took away from that investigation was that faith is a kind of knowledge, a kind of knowledge that's based on testimony, 
And while faith is a unique kind of testimonial knowledge, much of our knowledge is testimonial. So whatever is distinct about faith, it's not completely different from the way that we know other things. And that's important to bear in mind because it's not that faith is this you know, completely other type of experience where we close our eyes, grit our teeth, and leap, right? Um, so much of what we know, uh, we take on the testimony of others, everyday knowledge. Things that maybe we could verify for ourselves, but the process of verifying very often would rely on other testimonial knowledge. And, you know, it would be impossible to, to repeat, right, all of the experiments or to do all the investigative work we'd have to do to actually verify for ourselves all the way to the bottom everything that we take to be true. So the reason I mention that is just to, to flag up for your awareness that a lot of what we take ourselves very reasonably to know, we know not by direct experience or by our own demonstration, but on the testimony of others. Now, what that means is that testimonial knowledge, in principle, can be rational to, well, tes testimony can be rational to accept. It doesn't, of course, mean that we should always accept any testimony that we come across. We should make sure that, you know, the source is reliable, etc. Um, but in principle, um, it's not, uh, the fact that some content is testimonial, given by another, right, on the basis of their authority, um, is not irrational, right, or not unreasonable. So faith is a kind of knowledge based on testimony. And as testimonial, as based upon the disclosure of another person, faith is relational. We talked about how faith involves the initiation of an interpersonal relationship. That it's, it involves assent to propositions as true, but it goes beyond that, right? Because faith is more than just bullet points that you could list out in a catechism. It's about a living relationship with God or, or with another individual, like spouses or friends who are faithful to one another. So faith is a relational thing. It's not an emotion, right? It's not a feeling. And so also, it's not merely passive. It's not just something that happens to you if you get lucky. Um, so whether or not you have faith is not a matter of whether you were fortunate enough to have been, right, that this happened to you. Faith is an act. It's not purely passive. Um, it's an act that engages not only our intellect, but also our will. Um, faith is different from proof, right? So it's not that we're just passively persuaded by pure demonstration, like a geometrical proof or something like that, or a lab experiment where we can see directly the, the reaction occurred, right? The color of the, of the fluid changed or something like that. Um, it involves an act of will, right? That we give our assent. It involves a free act, a free choice to give our assent to some revelation, some, some content as true. So, Faith is an, act, an action, not a passion. It engages our intellect, but also our will. And it's a free act. It's an act of reason. So the act of faith is itself a rational act. We've got to have motives to believe. Even if belief isn't the conclusion of an argument, like a proof or a demonstration, still, faith is a rational act. And we've got to have rational motives. We have to have reasons for making that act just the way that we'd have reasons for any other choice we made, right? So if our will is engaged, think of any, any time you make a choice, you're always acting for the sake of something. You always have a reason for doing what you're doing. If it's not just some scratching an itch or whatever, but if it's an intentional act, right, you always have reasons. So if faith, like other intentional acts, right, uh, is a motivated, rational act, well, we've got reasons for it. So faith and reason not only are complementary, but the act of faith is also an act of reason. However, it's an act of reason that's, un, I'd say, underwritten by or provided through grace. So faith is still a gift. That's sort of a paradox, and maybe we'll have the opportunity later to go into that in a little more detail, but faith is at the same time a human action that we do. So faith is not just something that we, of our own efforts, uh, arrive at. Right? But it is a, a gift of grace. And then finally, last time we met, we disambiguated three things that I think, you know, once you point out, it's clear how they're different, but I think often we don't notice that these are three different things. And those were belief in a God, incipient faith, and saving faith. 
right? So belief in a god is not necessarily faith. One could conclude that there exists this higher being, this creator, on the basis of natural reason, and that's not the same thing as saving faith. It's not the same thing as entering into a relationship with Jesus or in the Old Testament, accepting God's covenant offer or something like that. It's something preliminary to it, but it's not quite yet faith. It has a relationship to faith for reasons that I hope tonight will become a little bit clearer. I describe belief in a God as a kind of preamble to faith. So just as I indicated a moment ago, that faith is a rational act. It has to have motives one of the preambles or one of the rational motives that's a stepping stone toward faith is belief that there is a God. Okay, so it's, it's related to faith, but it's not the same thing as faith. Second, there's incipient faith, and we illustrated that last week by considering baptism, right? Um, when you take your child in to be baptized, or if you're an adult seeking baptism, um, in the right, one of the first questions is, uh, what do you ask of the church, right? And, 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 and it's faith, right? Baptism actually confers faith. And yet you wouldn't be seeking baptism if you didn't have faith in some respect, right? So there's an incipient faith that's kind of an initial ascent to the gospel. And that kind of gets the process started. But then there's saving faith, which is a gift that's infused by God that involves, right, the elevation of your nature. You're actually transformed and incorporated into Christ by this, made a member of his body. You become a partaker in divinity, as one of the epistles of the New Testament puts it. Right? We actually become divinized, and that's an amazing thing, um, which maybe, maybe later we'll have the opportunity to talk about. But imagine the dignity right, that, that we have created in God's image and likeness, that we're created to actually share in God's own life, to be taken beyond our mere humanity, and made an adopted child of God. Right? That's not a metaphor, that's a literal truth. And it happens through the sacraments and through the grace that they confer. Faith is what initiates that. Faith is the gateway to that new life where we actually become a member of God's family. Right? Think of God as a triune right? communion of persons. We're drawn up into that through faith and the sacraments. So that's saving faith. So those are three different things related to one another, but, but they're distinct. So, in a nutshell, that's what we uh, covered last week. The handouts, if you had a, a chance to look at them, you didn't have to read them all. They were kind of thick last week. Um, I gave you a few items. One was, uh, besides the outline, um, the document De Filius. That's from the First Vatican Council, and it's on faith and reason. So, it, it overlapped with a lot of what we talked about. Um, most of us, I think, know a good deal or some about Vatican II. Vatican I tends to be a little bit more of a forgotten council, but that's how we got a Vatican II. Vatican I was supposed to cover many of the topics that didn't get addressed until the 1960s. They had 51 draft documents for Vatican I on a range of topics, including on the church and many other things. And uh, unfortunately, Vatican I got cut short for, for contingent historical reasons. The, the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War was what spelled the end of Vatican I. There were French troops defending Rome against the Italian nationalists who want a unified Italy, right? And when the Franco-Prussian uh, War broke out, the French withdrew from Rome to go fight in the war, and the Italian nationalists took Rome. And so it created havoc, and they, they had to end the council. So they only issued two documents. That was the document I gave you on faith and reason, and then a second document on papal infallibility. So that was the council where that, that teaching was defined. So I gave you that. And then the other item I gave you that was a little bit longer was from the previous ecumenical council, the Council of Trent. That goes several hundred years back in time to the 16th century. And the reason I gave you that document is that in its discussion of justification, it talks about faith and this distinction of incipient faith and living faith. Um, we probably don't have enough time to parse all that out, but it's really worth reading closely when you get the chance. The other thing I gave you last week is something that we'll talk about tonight, and that's the short passage from St. Thomas Aquinas on the five ways. So, with that, um, yeah. Uh, when you 
Yeah. But in fact, we know that what people actually do are based on other other motivations. Yeah. Okay, so give me an example. So how does that translate into our discussion of faith? Yeah, okay, so I think what you're getting at um, is, is this point, that when people act, right, so we're interested in getting at the act of faith, but we're comparing that with human acts in general. And when it comes to human acts, we might distinguish acts of humans and human acts. Acts of humans are kind of irrelevant. It's, I scratch an itch, it's non-deliberate. But even when we think about human acts, intentional acts, um, I think what you're getting at is that very often we have hidden motives or mixed motives or motives that maybe we're not even aware of because we don't know ourselves very well, um, as well as probably the fact that when we act, we might think we're acting for reasons, but very often we're acting in unreasonable ways. Is that what you're getting at? Am I getting yeah, that right? Yeah. Okay, so what I, would, what I would offer to try to clarify that is that um, setting aside acts of humans, focusing on human acts, um, it's true that sometimes we can act for emotional motives um, as opposed to rational ones. Um, and very often, you know, if we do this deliberately, I think there is a hidden rational motive there. And it's usually that we rationally identify some kind of inner harmony to be the good that we're going after. For example, um, I go and I eat the chocolate cake that I know I shouldn't eat because I'm diabetic. And, you know, I'm doing that because it feels good and the cake smells really good. Um, but I don't think it's purely emotional, right? Inside me, I, I, I think to myself, this, it's too painful to resist the cake, right? And it would be good if that just went away. I would just feel much more settled if I satiated my appetite, that delicious smelling cake, right? So I'm not saying that's a reasonable thing to do. But what I'm pointing out is that there is a reason at work there, okay? So th the last point I'd make to try to shed a little bit of light on this is that um, I think there's a difference between acting reasonably and acting for reasons, right? Or, or to put it differently, I think there's a difference between acting reasonably and acting rationally. So every sin, every wrongful action um, is unreasonable, right? What makes an act to be wrong is that it isn't reasonable. If an act fully conformed to, to the moral truth, to what right reason dictates, it wouldn't be a sin, it would be a good action, right? So every bad action somehow is deficient in its rationality. But it's not like scratching an itch, it's not like acting out of an emotional impulse. When people do bad things, they do it very deliberately for reasons a lot of the time. So the action is rational, right? When, when someone steals a car or somebody embezzles money from a bank, that's a rational action, right? It's very deliberate. There's a lot of reflection. They're acting for a reason. They want to get money in order to get, right, money for a trip or for medication or for their kid's education or whatever, right? There's definitely reasons in play. But not conforming to reason as wholly as it should. So I would say that's a rational action, but it's not a reasonable action, right? So even unreasonable actions can still be rational. I think does, maybe, that, maybe that helps a little bit to what you were getting well, at. I think probably most of the time what we're doing has this underlying part of it. I mean, that's the whole point of advertising and everything else. So Absolutely. So there's a lot of elements, and somehow I'm thinking that some of the Know, the Holy Spirit. There's something else that we were talking about yes. that provides that, okay. that, uh, that peace. Yeah, so I focus narrowly, yeah, I focus, in my presentation on faith and reason, I focus narrowly on our kind of intellectual activities. But you're absolutely right. We're embodied beings. We have emotions. And anytime that we think, we're always being impacted. We're always thinking in a context of being an embodied, emotion type of being. Um, you mentioned advertising. When was the last time you saw an advertisement that gave you a reason to buy what was being advertised? Right? It's amazing that advertisement, advertisement works, but it, but it works tremendously well. That's why people spend so much money on it. Usually advertisements don't give you any reasons, right? They, they just purely, it's a psychological game, right? What does this mean for faith and for our discussion of faith and reason? One thing that it points up that I didn't discuss last week is that while faith is a rational act and we have to have rational motives for making that act, that never happens in a vacuum, 
And it can be an easy mistake to slip into, to, to focus on all of the stuff that we're talking about, to the exclusion of the human dimension of leading someone to faith. They need the rational arguments, they need the understanding because they're a rational creature. But before you can get to that, I think people have to be disposed. And someone's becoming disposed to consider the reasons for the faith has a lot to do with their emotions. It has a lot to do with things like beauty or the beauty of an upright life. Right? That's why reading Mother Teresa's biography is sometimes more powerful than reading Thomas on the five ways, which I think are very important. We're going to talk about those tonight. But um, seeing, so do you know um, Peter, Peter Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens? Do you know that name? Christopher Hitchens, the new atheist, right? I heard him speak once. Um, his brother, Peter Hitchens, as you might know, is a convert, right? So they were very different from one another later in life. Um, one was a believer, one, one was an atheist. Both were famous, right? And, but as youths, they were both atheists. And what triggered Peter Hitchens, the one who converted, what triggered his conversion was a painting. So this is kind of an example of what you're getting at. He saw a painting of a depiction of all things of hell. And that's what kind of triggered him to be open to considering the reasons for the faith. So I think that there's a very big, so we're in a sense touching the tip of the iceberg. When we're talking about the kind of philosophical reasons why one ought to assent to belief in God and so on, that's important. But it's the tip of the iceberg. And a very big part of the task is, especially today I think, is creating the dispositions so that people can consider those arguments openly. Because so many people have a knee-jerk reaction against faith or against the church um, for a whole variety of reasons. And so the question is not just how do we make good arguments, but how do we live in such a way that people will listen, right? How do we open them emotionally? I think that's extremely important. Um, blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman had great insight into that point. Um, he recognized the need for virtue to have faith, right? That no argument, however good philosophically, is ever really complete. That doesn't mean that they're unsound arguments. It just means that you, you can always raise more questions, right? All arguments are kind of gappy, right? And if you're not disposed to follow, the, it's like a connect the dots picture, right? Some of, some of the connect the dots, I look, my kids do this, I have young kids, right? And on the easy connect the dots, right, the dots are really close together, and there's a lot of them. You can almost see the picture. But on the harder ones, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to guess, right, where you're supposed to go, and you can't just see the image. An argument can be kind of like that, right? Um, an argument could go through, but the dots are a little bit farther apart, right? And, and unless you're willing to kind of go with the argument, it's harder to concede point to point to point and get to the conclusion. You can always push back, raise questions, raise objections. And so what the person would do, the interlocutor would give more premises, right? Elaborate the argument in greater detail. That's why the five ways, which you can put on one part of one page in the handout I gave you, um, one of those five ways can be the subject of a 500 page book. If you go to the library, you can find books on a single one of the five ways. It's the same basic argument, but it's just elaborated. Why do you do that? Well, you do that in order to forestall objection. You do that in order to put the, the points a little bit closer so that someone can follow the trail of crumbs, right? So I think that you know, one of the things that this points up is that there's a need subjectively for a person to be able to follow an argument, to be open, to be disposed. And so much of that task isn't just giving reasons. It's, it's showing love. It's showing charity. It's exemplifying a beautiful way of life. Um, the fathers of the church have, uh, Gregory of Nyssa uh, has some wonderful things to say about that. Yeah. I saw a hand up over here. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just picking up the outline. Um, so I just recapped what we did last week, and I'm just beginning tonight's outline now. Okay, thank you. Um, so, faith and revelation. Um, there's a connection between faith and revelation. We've been talking about the nature of faith its relationship to reason. I want to focus on the relationship to revelation. Faith is different from a rational demonstration or a conclusion reached by way of a proof, right, for reasons that we can already see. It's knowledge that's based on testimony. So when I give 
my ascent, right, when I make an act of faith, it's not that I'm doing that because I see that the, the thing I'm assenting to is proven, right? It's not, that's, maybe it has been, but that's not why I give the act of assent. In the case of faith, the reason why I say I believe is because I trust the authority that's testifying, right? I take it on the authority of my doctor, right, that I ought to avoid sugars, right, um, being a diabetic, say, right? Um, I haven't, I, I could prove that, right, I could go through the science and see that I ought to do that, but I take it on his authority. So religious faith is analogous to that, right? It's, it's belief in something, belief in something about God or something that God reveals on the basis of God's own authority, not because it was demonstrated to me to be so, okay? So we give our assent to this content on the basis of divine authority. Why? Because God is trustworthy, right? Because God is trustworthy. He's, he can neither deceive nor be deceived. God who is the first truth, right? So faith presupposes this testimony. It presupposes revelation. Faith doesn't make sense, it, the theological faith, doesn't make sense outside the context of some revelation from God. So let's try to probe that a little bit further. What is revelation? Um, revelation is testimony. It's the self-disclosure of God. God shows himself to us. There's many ways we could come to know God. Some things we couldn't know unless God showed us, right? So we can know that there's a God, and we'll see how as we go on. But we couldn't know, for example, that God is triune. There's no way to demonstrate that, right, just from our experience of the world. So God reveals certain things to us that we could know, maybe by reason, and other things he reveals to us that we could never know unless he revealed them. But revelation is testimony. It's God's testimony about himself. It's his self-disclosure. Another important thing about revelation is that this is never just information about God, right? When God tells us about himself, he's never doing that just for the sake of giving us facts about him, right? Like facts in the telephone book. Revelation is always, again, relational. We talked about that last week, right? So when God reveals, he reveals in order to draw us into relationship with him, to draw us into friendship with him, and so that he can save us. So revelation always occurs in the context of God initiating and furthering a relationship whereby we, we are saved from sin and from evil, whereby we experience life in and, in and with God, salvation. So it's, it's always directed toward salvation. Now, how does God reveal? In a broad sense, you could say that creation itself is revelation, right? Because effects reflect their causes. Just like we talked last week about the crime scene and how evidence, right, points toward, right, effects point toward their causes and they reveal something about their causes. Well, the whole world is like that, like Romans 1.20 tells us, right? The whole world is kind of like a mirror of God. Or it reflects God's glory, reflects his goodness. And so it, it, it shows us something about him. But in a way beyond that, when we use the word revelation, usually we mean it in a narrower sense. Not just that the world reflects its maker, but that God has done something unique. God has broken into the world in a unique way to speak to us, right? So that's what we might call supernatural revelation. Um, and the examples of this are obvious, right? Think of the inspiration of scripture, right? Prophecy, things like that. Um, God reveals through his word, okay? So God discloses himself to us through a kind of a speech act. God talks to us, right? Um, what's, what's an example of this? Th think of an example. What's like, maybe the most famous example you can think of of God revealing in this way, kind of breaking in, saying, here I am, right? Revealing himself to, to humanity. Think of a famous example of that, yeah. Okay, the parting of the Red Sea. So God's definitely acting, right? He's interacting with his people in a saving way. They're already in a relationship then, though, right? Because he's leading them out. They're trusting him. How do they get to that stage of the relationship, right? They're already kind of, they're a few steps down the road. How, does that, how do they get to that point? What happens first? The burning bush, right? Exodus 3.14, sort of a paradigmatic case of revelation. 
got the Genesis account, God the creator, right? Adam knows God, Adam walks with God, but then there's the fall. There's this great rupture between humankind and God. And God gradually, starting right then, but very gradually, begins to work out the salvation of the human race. And that relationship grows, right, through a succession of covenants. Well, a very significant moment is when God personally reveals himself to one individual, to Moses, right, the burning bush. And he says, I am who I am, right? He reveals his name, which is significant because the name kind of captures your identity, right? Just think of all the effort we go through and we name our children, right? The name is full of significance about who someone is. And in Hebrew culture, if, someone, if you gave someone your name or you knew someone's name, it was like, you know, you had some kind of almost, not mastery over them, but kind of like this very intimate relationship that involved a kind of back and forth. So God, who wants to save his people, speaks to them, makes himself known to them. And he speaks to Moses, and he reveals his name to Moses. And this happens in the context of a miracle. We want to touch on that in a moment. But how does God get Moses' attention? Um, he doesn't just hear a voice, but he sees something that he can't explain. This bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. He goes over to investigate, and then he hears the voice of God. Okay? So that's kind of a, a, a paradigmatic case of God speaking, God revealing uh, by his word. So, of course, that builds, right? You mentioned the Red Sea, right? They're led out of slavery. That builds across the entire Bible, right? And so God speaks to individuals like Moses, who, to whom he gives the law. He speaks to the prophets of the Old Testament. Um, he speaks, right, in the New Testament as well, but we see God speaking to an individual, and then that testimony is recorded in writing. So that's how we get scripture, right? So first you have God talking to someone, but then that event gets recorded and passed on in a tradition, right? So think of the books of Moses, right? How do we know the Ten Commandments? Well, one answer is because God spoke to Moses and related that content. But a second answer is someone after Moses handed it on, Right? Someone wrote it, well, God right, wrote it down, but that content was handed on. And you could say that for the whole of Scripture. So, in one sense, God reveals by inspiring sacred writers. Those are the human authors of the books of the Bible. So, you've got God speaking to individuals, and you've got God inspiring authors that record his message. And then that message is transmitted, right? Either orally or right, in, in a tradition where it's written down and handed on, preserved intact. One of the things that that shows us is that this transmission of God's revelation depends on a tradition. So tradition is not just the static, the way we do things because it's always been done. I think we have that, that sense of, of tradition. But what does the word tradition mean? Do you know? What is the, what is the original meaning of the word tradition? To, to hand on, right, from the Latin verb trado, to, to hand over. So tradition is more of a verb, right? It's a handing on. It's a living reality. So God reveals, and then that revelation is transmitted through a living tradition. That's where we get the Bible. That's where we get the, the particular books that we have as the books of the Bible. So the inspiration of Scripture is one way that God speaks. But someone asks you, what is the word of God? How would you answer that question? What is the word of God? We hear that all the time at Mass, right? The word of the Lord. But what, is, what is the word of God? Any idea? Yeah, it's his message to us, but, but what's the climax of that message? Yeah, Jesus, it's a person. So the Word of God, you might think, is the Bible. And it is, right? The Scriptures. But even beyond that, God's Word is a person, right? It's the Logos, the eternal Logos. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God's revelation, God's Word to us, first and foremost, is a person. It's God the Son, the second member of the Trinity. And that Word is conveyed to us through the Incarnation, Right? So God the Son, the, the, the eternal word, becomes human in time and reveals God to us because he is God. But now the, the ineffable, transcendent, invisible God has a human face. So that's amazing, right? This is even more magnificent than God speaking to Moses. It's even more magnificent from 
than stone tablets that record God's word and God's way of life, God's laws. This is God himself, face to face, speaking to us. Think of what it must have been like to be on the mount, right, for the Sermon on the Mount, to listen to, to Christ's preaching of the kingdom. It's, it's God himself speaking. So now God is not just speaking through an intermediary, God himself is speaking. Yeah, you had a, a hand up a second ago. Uh, was the word ever understood to be of the Holy Spirit also? So the, the, there were questions about how to understand wisdom. There's this figure of wisdom in the Old Testament, and different fathers of the church you know, kind of debated back and forth as to whether wisdom in the Old Testament, the wisdom of God, was the Son or the Spirit. But the Logos was always the Son. I don't think there was ever any debate about, about that, right? So uh, in terms of the Trinity, right, the Word of God, the Logos, is always identified with God the Son. It's another name for God the Son. And it has to do with this particular characteristic, right, as the image of the Father coming forth as, right, the, the, the Logos is God's Word. He comes forth through God's act of knowing, right? We could talk about that maybe next week in greater detail. Um, so God's Logos, God's Word, is God the Son. And God the Son, become man, is the ultimate self-revelation of God. So before any creedal statements or anything that you can encapsulate in a human language, there's God with a human face speaking directly with us. And then, of course, what he said was recorded, or at least some of it. The, the authors tell us that all the books in the world couldn't contain everything that he related. But we got some of it handed on through the generations, um, through the apostles, and through the patrimony of the church. So there again, we have written scriptures. And those written scriptures are formulated and handed on in the context of a living chain, a living tradition. And we ourselves are part of that living tradition. Right? Think about that. That's an amazing thing. The tradition that gave us the Bible isn't something that just happened 1,500 or 2,000 years ago with famous figures like St. Athanasius or with Origen or Tertullian or Ignatius of Antioch. The reality that they lived is the same reality that you're living at St. Mary's. Right? You are living links in that same chain, which is the apostolic tradition. So that same reality that gave us the words and deeds of Christ is the reality that you are living by virtue of your baptism. So that's an amazing, that places an amazing demand on you, but it's also an amazing um, reality. Okay, so God reveals in this way, paradigmatically through his son, and then this revelation is transmitted by the words, the written words of scripture, but also by the sacred tradition, something that, that we tap into ourselves the whole reality of the church's life. Okay. Um, now, a final point about revelation. Notice this. Belief in the existence of God is a preamble to the recognition of revelation. So what do I mean by that? You can't recognize something as revelation if you don't already believe. Because why would you think that this is God speaking? Right? If you didn't have a concept that there's a God who could be communicating, you would just think you're crazy, or this guy's crazy, he's hallucinating, or something like that. You'd have no grounds for thinking that anything is actually divine revelation. So I think it's, that's another step that's easy for us to skip over. And it's important um, in leading others to faith to remember that there's a step there that needs to be made. Right? Um, it does no good to quote the Bible to an atheist. Right? Um, in order to recognize something as revelation, you've already got to have the idea that there is a God, that there is a creator, and he's capable of speaking, he's capable of revealing. Okay, so that's important. How do we then know when he is speaking? Right? So if you've got this belief that there's a God, and you've got some content right, that's purportedly from him, he's disclosing himself to you, how do you know that that's an instance of God communicating? Right? Because there might be a God, and this might still be a hallucination, right? Or this might still be something that's not trustworthy or not from God. It could be from a demon or something like that, right? How do you know when you're dealing with revelation? That's where the burning bush comes in, right? So God speaks to Moses, but how does Moses know that it's God speaking? Well, because God gives a sign. So what are miracles? Miracles you might think of as signs or maybe signals 
from the Creator. And their function is always to authenticate revelation, right? To authenticate revelation. So miracles are never just shows, right? They're never just wonderful deeds that, you know, amaze us. Miracles always have a function within the context of a communication, a relationship that has communication going on. And their function within that context is to kind of be like a stamp or a guarantee that this content has a divine source, right? And then the way they do that is by being inexplicable by other means, right? So Moses thinks that this voice is from God because what could possibly explain this burning bush that isn't being consumed? Who could cause such a thing? He can't identify any known cause in the world, no physical cause. He could, if he were a modern post-enlightenment skeptic, he could hold out and he could say, well, I don't know, but there's definitely an explanation and we'll find it someday, even if it's after my lifetime. Um, Moses didn't have to deal with modern skepticism. He had a concept of God the creator, right? Even if his knowledge of God was, was vague initially, he knew that there was this creator and he didn't see any physical explanation for, for the phenomenon he was observing. And yet he knew that God, if God has the capacity to make the world, if he has the capacity to call into existence from nothing what is, then certainly he's, he has the capacity to perform this act, right? To make a bush burn but not be consumed. If God can give being, he's, he's the only one that can right, give being to this bush that's being eaten up, right? And he's replenishing it at the very instant it's being eaten up, right? So the miracle is a sign, it's a signal that indicates that, you know, the, what Moses is hearing, the word that he's hearing, is from the Creator. So that's the, the function of a miracle. They authenticate God's self-disclosure. And think of this even in the Gospels, right? Um, Jesus reveals God to us in person by words and by deeds, right? It's not just his preaching, but it's also, he's not just a wonder worker. The deeds and the words go together, and the deeds authenticate the words, right? How do you know that Jesus is God the Son? Well, by what he says, but also by what he does, right? Both reveal his identity to us. So miracles are like the, are the deeds part of Revelation. Revelation is always words and deeds, okay? Um, notice this too. Like Revelation, the recognition of something as a miracle presupposes belief in God's existence, right? Because the fact that something is, the fact that I can't identify what's making this happen doesn't mean it's God making it happen, of course, right? We shouldn't be quick to assume that unexplained phenomenon are supernatural or are miracles. Take, for example, the church's own skepticism in the canonization process. Right? The church herself is very skeptical about miracle claims. And the church, of course, believes that there are miracles, right? The whole faith is founded on the, the resurrection of Christ, which is a miracle. Paul tells us if that's not true, we may as well, may as well pack up and go home, right? But the church is very skeptical about miracle claims, right? So we shouldn't just assume that whenever we have an unexplained event or phenomenon, that therefore it's, you know, it's directly God intervening. It's a miracle. It could be that it has a natural cause and we just haven't identified what it is yet. And the fact that that happens all the time is why science has, makes progress, right? Science, scientific discoveries are being made every day. We're unlocking the secrets of nature. We're explaining phenomenon that we don't know how to explain until we observe it and replicate it and then we come up with an explanation. So all the time, we're finding ways of explaining things that we didn't initially know how to explain. We don't think that we're dealing with miracles all the time. Okay, but to recognize something as a miracle, you've got to have the concept of a creator, right? Because otherwise, everything that you encountered that was unexplained would be something that you were just sure someday, right, we'd be able to give the, the scientific account for why this happened, right? The Red Sea parts, well, it's got to be explicable. There's some crosswind or... Uh, you know, the multiplication of the loaves, or think of any, the, the, the lame man that Jesus raises, um, that's made up, or, or it did happen, but it happened by way of some, you know, physicalistic explanation. It's amazing to see some of the accounts that have been made uh, in the 19th century. People during this period were 
very concerned to remove the supernatural elements of God's revelation. Have you ever heard of the Jefferson Bible? Yes. Yeah, so, so I mean, an example, right, from our own area and our own history, Thomas Jefferson, you know, liked the kind of generic content of the gospel message, but he wasn't comfortable with all the miracle accounts and the supernatural. And he literally sat down, and many, there were other figures that did this. He didn't live alone. He sat down with a pair of scissors, and he started cutting and excising the bits of the Gospels, the New Testament, that he thought were not historical. Right? Obviously, this is mythology. We're going to literally cut that out. And what we're going to be left with is this reliable substratum of the life and deeds of Jesus. Right? He's this great ethical leader, somebody like a Socrates or a Buddha, right? but not really distinctive or different. Right? So, you know, that, that's an example, right, of this kind of bias against the supernatural. The recognition of miracles presupposes belief in God's existence. If you don't allow for the existence of a creator, you're never going to recognize any rational basis for recognizing anything as a miracle. So, do miracles lead to faith? Well, I think yes and no. Um, could witnessing a miracle get you to believe that God exists? I think by way of a few steps it could. But the miracle just as such doesn't demonstrate that God exists, right? If you're committed to the idea God doesn't exist, that's just some phenomenon that we haven't yet explained. Right? You don't have any possibility of having recourse to a creator as the, as the explanation for it. But if you see something that's really magnificent and blows your mind, it might trigger the God question again, right? So even if in the first step it doesn't demonstrate, right, to you that there's a God, you don't immediately infer, that's a miracle, wow. Um, what it might be is, wow, I wonder if I should rethink if there's a creator, right? Because maybe science would explain this, but at a certain point it becomes more of a stretch to think that this has a naturalistic explanation than that maybe there's a God. Um, and, the, and, and the existence of God would give you a very easy explanation for what you're seeing. Think of Eucharistic miracles and things like that, right? Um, so miracles authenticate God's revelation. I think they can also grab our attention and make us revisit the question of God's existence. Um, but to recognize something as a miracle presupposes that you believe that there is a God. So miracles function within the context of Right, thinking that there's a God, and God revealing himself, and then the purpose of the miracle is to show you as a sign, this is God saying to you, this is me speaking, it's God speaking, listen, right, I have something to say to you. Okay, so miracles uh, and revelation lead to supernatural faith, but belief in a miracle is not the same thing as faith, right? So there too is an important distinction. Think of, after, after last week's meeting, um, I was talking with, with one of you about the resurrection. So think of it this way, right? Belief in the resurrection of Christ, that's not exactly the same thing as belief in Christ, is it? Right? Belief in the resurrection is not the same thing as faith, not the same thing as saving faith. Because you could have purely rational motives for believing that Christ rose from the dead, right? The evidence could all point that way. You might say that the testimony, maybe they're making it up, but there's no good reason to think that they're making it up. They seem to be credible witnesses. They're not gaining anything from this. In fact, they're going to their deaths over it. Um, right? No one denies the empty tomb. There are no, right, there are no accounts of, that, 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 that say, actually, we know where his grave is, etc. You could flesh out the argument. right? But to believe that Christ rose is not yet the same thing as believing in Christ. You believe that he rose as a matter of historical fact because you think the evidence is there. And then that triggers the question, well, what if he did rise? What does that mean? And that's the next step toward faith, right? So there again, there's something where we have belief in now a miracle. That's not faith, but it's another one of those stepping stones to faith, right? If Christ rose, then we have to rethink, right, what he said. Maybe he's vindicated. Maybe what he said was true. Maybe this is an indication that he is God's son, and so forth. And then, right, I enter into this saving relationship with Christ. So be belief in miracles is one of those preambles, or a stepping stone. And it works hand-in-hand -hand with revelation. Okay. Um,
We haven't yet dived into the philosophical proofs, right? The reasons for God's existence. So far, we've been talking all about faith. Um, and I, I'm aware that we're almost out of time, so we won't have a chance tonight to look at the five ways in detail. But in the remaining few minutes, let me at least just begin to introduce the five ways. So we've talked about faith. We've talked about faith and reason. And we've talked about faith's relationship to revelation. Faith is based on revelation. We've looked at what revelation is. Um, and we've looked at the importance of creation or belief in a creator for making any sense at all of revelation and of miracles. So that leads us to the key question. How do you, why should you believe, right, that there's a creator, right? If the whole thing gets off the ground, if God's self-disclosure that initiates the saving relationship, that's authenticated by his mighty deeds, if all of that gets off the ground against the background supposition that there is a creator, why should anyone think that there is a creator? Right? And we all know that, especially today, there are many voices saying we shouldn't, right? that it's irrational to believe in a creator. So what are the reasons why um, someone should believe in a creator? There are many avenues to explore there, but the one that I've chosen to, to explore with you um, is the, are the arguments that you find in the beginning of a work of St. Thomas Aquinas, so let me briefly introduce who he was and, and what these arguments are. And then next time we meet, we'll have a chance to look at them in greater detail and then kind of see where that leaves us and what that tells us about God. So the first step is, how do we know that there's a God? And if we can get there, then we have the, the basis to say, well, what is God like? What can we know about him now that we know that he's there, right? That there exists a God. Okay, who is Thomas Aquinas? How familiar are you with Aquinas or with the five ways? I think this is probably a mixed audience. Some of you maybe have heard of it, some of you maybe haven't. Who, who was Thomas Aquinas? Do you know? Yeah, he's a great systematic, great theologian of the church, a doctor of the church. He was a Dominican, one of the earliest members of the Dominican order. He lived in the 13th century, uh, from 1225 to 1274. And that was, in some ways, a, a great high point of the church's life, at least intellectually, that was a real high point for the church. That was the, the time when the, the medieval universities were flourishing. This is the Middle Ages, but it's not the Dark Ages, right? If you hear the, the reference to the, the Middle Ages being Dark Ages, they were anything but dark in the late 13th century. If you've been to Europe, if you've ever seen the Gothic cathedrals from this period, there were feats of engineering, there was great learning going on, um, this was not the collapse of the Roman Empire, 6th, 7th, 8th century, right? This was a very different Middle Ages uh, in the lifetime of St. Thomas Aquinas. And he was a great mind, perhaps the church's greatest theologian and a doctor of the church. Among his many writings that he produced in his short life was a... And the bit that I gave you last week that we'll look at is from the very beginning of the Summa Theologiae. And if you've ever read it, or read parts of it, or even read the handout that I gave you, um, it's amusing to, to realize that this was a textbook for beginners. So the, the, the title Summa Theologiae is a summary of theology, and it really is that. Uh, it's a sort of a summary, a cursory overview of what is almost the entire ambit of the Catholic faith. And it was intended to be a textbook for seminarians, for Dominican novices who were beginners, who were young, very young men actually, who were just beginning their studies of theology in order to, to be ordained uh, preachers. And so to be a good preacher, you've got to know your doctrine, you've got to know your scripture. So that was Thomas's vocation, to be a teacher and a, and a preacher, but especially a former of preachers, somebody who instructs, uh, equips people to preach. So this uh, work that we're looking at was his summary overview of the Catholic faith. And as detailed and as complex as it gets at some points, look at some of his other works, and then you'll see how it is, in fact, a textbook for beginners. So the structure, you'll have noticed if you looked at it, the structure is unusual. It doesn't read like an ordinary book with straightforward paragraphs and chapters. He has this kind of dialogical, dialectical format of back and forth, objections, replies, responses to the objections. It's very choppy. It can make it hard to read. It's modeled on how uh, professors taught in universities in medieval Europe. One of the things that we know about Thomas's own biography was that he held these live disputed questions where he'd go in a room like this and they would throw a question out for discussion and he would you know, field questions, arguments, and he would give an explanation of some point of doctrine. 
This was commonly done. But one of the things we know about St. Thomas was that he did these at a rate that was unprecedented. It's, it's almost, he died fairly young, and one wonders, you know, whether he worked himself, right, to death doing this. Um, but this was the background that provided so much of the raw material for his writings. Um, they were actual exchanges with students that he had. And whereas in the Summa, you might get three or four counter-arguments, then his position, its explanation, and then a reply to those four, three or four, in some of his other works, he may entertain 15 or 20 or 25 counter-arguments on this side, then on that side, then his position. So this really is a summary uh, by, by way of comparison. So that's what we're looking at. It's a work from a long time ago, but it's still relevant to us today, right? It's relevant to us today because the reasoning in it is sound. It's also one of his mature works. He wrote this toward the end of his life, right? So this is his, it reflects his mature thinking. He gives us five uh, ways, five arguments to demonstrate the existence of God. And while we'll look at those in detail next week, a couple of uh, traits or features that I want to point out to you about these arguments. One, notice how succinct they are, right? So the Summa is a massive work. It encompasses three, depending on how you look at it, three or four volumes or parts, it's thousands of pages in length, right? Um, each part is broken up into questions. Each question is broken up into articles, right? And each article has those little component parts that I mentioned to you, the counter arguments, his own position, and then his replies. The five ways come within the context of one article, of one question, of one part of the Summa. And they're treated in a matter of paragraphs, right? It's very, very brief. So the five ways are one of the most famous pieces of Thomas's theological right, legacy. Um, and that's for good reason, but they, they kind of get disproportionate attention. There, there's much more attention given to them than, than maybe is even appropriate. Um, why is that? Partly it's from our context, our post-enlightenment context. We wrestle with the question of God's existence. People didn't wrestle with that question in Thomas's day. In the whole of human history, right, people generally didn't wrestle with that question the way that we have in the last 300 years. So we live in kind of an anomalous period. Human beings have always, for as varied and as, as deficient as our notions of God have been in different religions and different cultures and different times, the fact that, that there is a God of some kind has been virtually universal throughout human history. So in context, Thomas is not arguing with modern atheists, and so he doesn't spend a lot of time on this. We who are worried about modern atheism look at the five ways, and sometimes they're criticized for their brevity or for an alleged lack of probity. I've had many, not here, but other places, I've had undergraduates who, I'm convinced, dogmatically believe that the five ways don't work as arguments. And they think this not because they've actually wrestled with the arguments, but because they've been told that by their professors. A perfect example of testimonial knowledge, alleged knowledge. Right? It's, that's faith, right? So much of what we take, we take on the authority of another. How many of my former students, how many young people today that study philosophy or religion in college or even in high school are introduced to the five ways as the sort of classic example of how we can demonstrate God's existence? And they're told, well, these arguments don't work for this reason or that reason. Newtonian physics undermines the argument or etc. They conclude in God, but why should we think that the first mover is God or the uncaused cause is God? It makes an illicit jump. They're given all kinds of reasons why these arguments don't work, but they, by and large, don't actually wrestle with the arguments. They take it on the faith of their teachers, right? They take it on the authority of their teachers. So it's very ironic, okay? The reason I point that out is it's true. The five ways are very brief. They're stated very succinctly. And they're not uh, put forward by Thomas as an apologetic for faith, right? He doesn't have to deal, he doesn't have to make apologetic arguments for the existence of a God. He might have to make apologetics, uh, apologetical arguments for the Catholic faith um, against, right, Muslims or, or other groups. But that there's a God, right, is a step that he demonstrates for methodological reasons. In the Summa Theologiae, his objective is to do theology faith-seeking understanding. He's assuming that his readers have faith, and his job is to explicate the faith. So he doesn't have to prove to them God exists, but as a methodological first step, 
he's going to talk about who God is and what God is like. He, as a matter of scientific procedure, first has to demonstrate that there is a God. And then with that out of the way, he can go on to do what he wants to do. So you can see it's just one piece of one article that all this attention right, is focused upon. And then the big task fills four more volumes and thousands of pages. Now, that doesn't mean that the arguments don't work or that they're deficient or that they can't work in the context of apologetics, but it does mean that we probably need to amplify those arguments if we're going to engage modern skepticism. Um, right? So we'll look at that next time when we come back. Uh, but what I want to do is just give you a, a, an appreciation for the context of the five ways to see what they're intended to do and what they're not intended to do, but then also to make the point that they are serviceable to do things that they weren't intended to do originally. Right? They can answer modern skepticism. We'll look at how next time we meet. Okay? Um, conscious of the time, I won't hold, hold you for questions, but I'm happy to talk with anyone if you have questions uh, afterward. Thank you very much.